Regular meeting number seven will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. Remy, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, Council is grateful to have Pastor Lamont Glover from Kingdom Discipleship Ministries to pray with us. Pastor, welcome back to Council. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Let's go before the throne of grace. The word says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for this opportunity, God, to be in your presence. We ask, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you would give each and every council member here the wisdom and discernment that they need as they strive to address the concerns, the issues, and problems of our community. We ask God not just for this session, but for every future session that they will have. We ask you, O oh God, to give them divine wisdom, divine strategy, divine principles to know what to do, when to do, how to do, what to say, when to say, and how to say it so we can move this community forward. God, we thank you for what you're going to do, Lord God. Give them the strength, give them the peace that they need. God, we need not just good answers, but we need God answers to address what's happening, O oh God. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Now, God, help us to put our work with our faith and move forward in you. Bless them. Keep them, oh God. Do what you need to do in our lives so that we'll have a closer walk and a much more consecrated life with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Thanks, for Rosa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber Green, Remy White, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Can I get a motion to with the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Aukauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Are there any corrections or additions to the journal? Here, none. The journal is approved. This week's communication received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications read into the record? Not at this time. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mm -hmm. We'll go around the dais with announcements and resolutions from my colleagues, starting with Councilman Bankston. Uh, thank you, President Harden. Um, just another reminder to everyone that the Accelerate Columbus program is now live. Uh, it will remain open again until all program spots are filled. Just as a refresher, uh, this is a free city-funded small business training program focusing on topics such as marketing, website development, and small business growth. Uh, this year, uh, we will have uh, we have 10 sub-programs that small business owners and entrepreneurs can choose from uh, that best fit their scenario and their business's life cycle. To see the full list and to apply, please visit the city's small biz hub at cbussmallbizhub.com, where you can find more information and apply for the program. That's all I have. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Rosa de Padilla. 
Thank you, Council President. Um, I wanted to take one moment uh, before we start our meeting off today um, to first welcome and thank all of the advocates that are here in Council Chambers this evening. And I would like to take a moment specifically to address our folks from the transit community that I know many of them are here this evening. Since October, there have been six cyclists and pedestrian deaths on our streets, including two children. Traffic violence has become acceptable where we see crashes as accidents and not the tragedies and acts of violence that they are. There are two significant pieces to ensuring that we keep people safe on our streets and that we move from being car-centric to people-centric. We need both infrastructure and culture change. We need to redesign, rethink, and rebuild our roads to make them safer for all users. This includes the addition of protected bike lanes, shared use paths, the addition of sidewalks and tools to reduce speed and add additional safety measures for pedestrians and cyclists to cross intersections. And while projects like Vision Zero, Link Us, Bike Plus will bring much needed infrastructure changes across the city, we acknowledge that we need solutions more quickly. As a chair of public service and transportation, it is my intention to continue to engage with our residents and advocates in the process of improving pedestrian and cyclist safety on our streets in a frequent and intentional way. Additionally, we're advocating for a significant amount of dollars towards tactical urbanism and short-term safety solutions and demonstrations like open streets that puts pedestrians first. And lastly, it is my hope that if you are sitting in this room with us today or watching online, that you think about the split-second decisions that we each make every day. Like when you choose to answer that text while driving or speed through a red light because you're running behind or become impatient with the driver next to you or to get to that next place. We're making decisions every day that quite literally are life and death. And these decisions while operating vehicles have impacts and ramifications well beyond us as individuals. They affect whole families and communities. And I implore all of us to do better and to think of each other. And so we'll have an opportunity later this evening to hear from the um, activists and to hear from the transit community that has signed up to speak. And we'll have more of a dialogue. But I did want to give one second to, um, more than one second, to introduce um, our interim director of public service, Kelly Skoko. So Kelly, I want to give you the floor for a moment. Good evening, President Hardin, Chair Rosa de Padilla, members of council. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to give some remarks. I want to first like to acknowledge that behind those fatal crashes, there are people. There are brothers, sisters, mothers, children. They have faces. So I want to take that moment to acknowledge them. No one should lose their life or experience the devastating loss of a loved one from a crash. These crashes should not happen and are preventable. One is too many. Like cities all over the country, for decades, roadways like Morris Road and other major thoroughfares were built to be car-centric and to carry fast-moving traffic. The Department of Public Service is working with our Vision Zero partners, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, CODA, Columbus Public Health, and others, to change the built environment to change behaviors so that we can create a culture of traffic or roadway safety and to add infrastructure to build walkable, bikeable communities that makes it more comfortable and safe to walk and ride a bike. I just want to take a moment to say that I am a mother. I bike and walk around the city's, city streets of Columbus with my children. I have a 14-year-old that's trying to, you know, get a little bit of independence and in biking out there by himself. So this hits home. Our transportation infrastructure alone is only part of the solution, though. It is a big part. We also need a partnership with all of our residents for a culture change to put safety first before speed and getting from point A to point B as fast as possible. When we all slow down, drive sober, put our phones down, and pay close attention to our surroundings, we absolutely will save lives. Even one death on our roadways is too many. 
through our major transportation initiatives that the council member mentioned, including Vision Zero Columbus, Bike Plus, and Link Us, we are laser focused on transforming our local roadway system to put safety first, whether you are walking, biking, using the bus, or driving a vehicle on city streets. Thank you. Thank you, Interim Director. Um, and thank you, Council President, for giving us a moment. I know that it was, um, uh, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge where we are as a city. We wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, the challenges that we've had with infrastructure. Uh, we're gonna have, again, I wanna thank all of our folks who are here today. It is always but for the people that change happens. We will have a dialogue. Thank you for your patience as we continue the rest of the meeting, but uh, we wanted to take this time to acknowledge where we are, acknowledge the conversations that we will have throughout this meeting and later in this meeting. Um, uh, but I wanted to give us the time to uh, acknowledge all the folks who took time to be here today, all of the written testimony that we also received here today from folks that didn't have the opportunity to sign up and um, again while it seems <clears throat> somber it is an important issue and we wanted to ensure that we took the time to address it now address it later and then continue to work together to for longer term solutions for our roadways so thank you council president thank you so much council member um, council member de Alcar. thank you president harden I have one announcement this evening. Franklin Soil and Water Conservation District has partnered with Columbus Recreation and Parks Department to develop the Columbus Urban Tree Assistance Program. This program is made possible by funding from Columbus Recreation and Parks Department and will offer up to $2,000 to five organizations that demonstrate a need and ability to complete a native tree planting project on private property in the city of Columbus. The applications opened up last week and it closes on February 29th. Civic associations, neighborhood associations, HOAs, area commissions, and other organized groups of landowners will be eligible to apply for this competitive assistance program. Planting must occur on private property in the city of Columbus. Successful awardees will work closely with Franklin Soil and Water Conservation District who will make all purchases and pay invoices on behalf of the project. The department will be hosting two virtual and in-person hybrid information sessions for this programming in the coming weeks, February 6th and February 21st, both at 6, 6 p.m. and both at 1404 Goodale Boulevard, Suite 100. Uh, please reach out to the department if you have any questions about this program. And that's all from me, Council President. Thank you, Council Member. Press well, Tim. Council Member Favor. Thank you, Council President Harton. February marks the beginning of Black History Month, a time for us to reflect on the historical and cultural contributions and achievements of Black Americans. This year's theme is African Americans and the arts, a nod toward the influence of black Americans and what the work that they have had on a number of artistic forms and expressions. Today, I would like to highlight Columbus's own Amanda, Amina Brenda Lynn Robinson, a Columbus legend whose art has touched the lives of so many across our city and our nation. Amina was born in Columbus and grew up in Poindexter Village, one of the nation's first federally funded public housing complexes. Art was one of Ms. Robinson's first outlet of expression, learning techniques from her parents that she later used in her work, including sewing and using raw materials. She studied at Columbus College of Art and Design, then Columbus Art School, and began a career within the arts that centered on illustrating the African-American experience of racism and discrimination. When Amina passed away in 2015, she left her art, writings, home, and personal trust to the Columbus Museum of Art. In 2020, the museum established the Menina, Amina Robinson Legacy Project to encompass the myriad aspects of her life and her awareness of her work and place her in the pantheon of the most important of the 20th and 21st century American artists where she deservedly belongs. The Amina Robinson Legacy Project is a multifaceted effort to preserve and promote the artist's work through documentation, preservation, and exhibition of her art and writings, provide her home as a residency and studio for artists and writers, and building upon her legacy through scholarship, education, community, engagement, and publications. She has been recognized across her country for her work, including the Ohio Governor's Award for Visual Art in 1984, 
and receiving a MacArthur Genius Grant for Folk Art in 2004. I will be posting black artist highlights on my social media throughout the month of February. These features will highlight local black artists and promote some of their, work piece, their previous work pieces uh, throughout this month. To follow along, you can uh, check out my Instagram account at Shayla Favor or Facebook profile at Shayla D. Favor. Do we have um, Mr. I'm sorry, Jewel Woods? Wonderful. Next, I have Resolution 018, 2024 to recognize February 12th through 18th as Black Girl Dad Week in the city of Columbus. Black Girl Dad Week is hosted annually in partnership between Mayo, Behavioral Health, and the Columbus Urban League to celebrate supportive fathers and their impact on their daughter's well-being. This year, the Black Girl Dad Week is being celebrated the week of February of 12th through the 18th, and it focuses on seven different thematic areas, one for each day of the week and includes events like the Black Father-Daughter Day Dance at COSI, among others. Research demonstrates that strong father-daughter relationships lead to happier and healthier women and leaves a lasting impact on fathers, including changing their behavioral patterns along a longer lifespan. This week-long event seeks to reshape that narrative by establishing a forum for constructive dialogue about how to foster positive relationships between Black fathers and their daughters. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Woods from Male Behavioral Health to, to provide some brief remarks. Excuse me. Thank you, Council President Hardin, members of uh, City Council, and special thank you to Council Person Favor. Black Girl Dad Week was born from a very simple observation. Uh, or belief, and that's the belief that it's better to light a candle than it is to curse the darkness. And so whether or not we spoke to, speak to the statistics of 70 or 80% of single parent households, the reality is that culturally, we know that there's a lot of fathers and father figures that are actually accepting the opportunity and responsibility to pour into the lives of women and girls. Politically, Black Girl Dad Week was born from the reality a couple years ago when we knew that Roe v. Wade was gonna be overturned and we felt like there was a need and opportunity for males, particularly men of color, to figure out how to partner with and support issues that affect women and girls, particularly black women and black girls. As a result of that, we actually created Black Girl Dad Week. And as the council person favorite mentioned, the whole week is designed to absolutely put in, in perspective all the opportunities that males have, not just African-American males, but males in general have to support women and girls. Monday is Politics Day. We will have Roland Martin, State of Black America, with Congresswoman Joyce uh, Beatty. I was just confirmed that Health and Human Secretary Xavier Baquera, apologies if I'm saying it wrong, will be joining us. Tuesday is Take, Take Your Daughter to School Day. We were partnering with Columbus City Schools, having an event actually at East High School. Wednesday is Take Your Daughter to Work Day. We are being partnered with the Columbus Chamber of Commerce to actually enroll and make sure that we have companies uh, that are actually on record saying that we're dedicated to uh, creating infrastructures for supporting the careers of women and girls. Uh, Thursday is a call to men. My mentor, Tony Porter, is coming to do a very important conversation about healthy manhood and masculinity. Friday is Healing and Reconciliation Day. Brilliant clinician, clinical psychologist Angela Chapman and I will be doing a conversation called Forgiven, uh, noting the fact that there are unfortunately many fractured relationships and families, an opportunity for us to kind of give some ideas about how to resolve that. As was mentioned, the ground tool is uh, Black Father Daughter Dance at COSI. Last year, we had over 700 people. We sold out with 800 people last week with over 300 people currently on the wait list. And finally is uh, Black Love and Relationship Night, which is we're having author Terry McMillan. You folks here at the City Council are probably too young to know who that author is. Oh. Um, but these are all events, again, uh, that for the city of Columbus and other cities actually, is just simply to change the narrative. It's not just African-American males, but males in general are trying to figure out their way in, in life these days. And anything that gives people meaning and purpose is, from me as a clinician, a protective mental health factor. So we thank you so much for acknowledging this day. We look forward to partnering with the city in the future. We will only get better and better, bigger and better. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Oh, no, don't go, no, don't go nowhere. <laughs> I got to give it to you first. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, for uh, the work that you all are doing. It is a robust week of events. If folks uh, tuning in want to learn a little bit more, is there a place that they can go to get more information? Thank you for that. Please go to blackgirldadweek.com. Made it pretty simple. Blackgirldadweek.com or go to blackfatherdaughterdance.com. Blackfatherdaughterdance.com. Wonderful. Are there uh, any comments by my colleagues? 
Well, someone who's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't see. I couldn't see over there. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in. As a dad of two girls, I'm excited to see that this is happening and appreciate all the work that you're doing to kind of highlight, you know, the importance of that relationship and, um, you know, being in the lives of our children. So Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. And I we will be doing Girl Dad Week more generally in June, so look forward to that as well. Wonderful. And then I will just say as, you know, a, a daddy's girl as well, you know, he's my first hero. And I just love the fact that you all are taking the time, uh, especially to, you know, emphasize this in the, the month of love. It's Black History Month as well. But then also um, expanding this to include all fathers uh, who want to strengthen their relationships with their daughters or their children in general. So I just applaud you on the, that effort Thank as you. well. And uh, can I embarrass my daughter and have her stand up? Oh, please here? stand up. Embarrass her. There she is. Yeah, just embarrass her. <laughs> Give her a round of applause, everybody. Thank With you so that, much. I'd move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, De Ockauer, Dorrance, Faber Green, Remy Weich, President Harden. Adopt it. That's all for me, Council President. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Green. Council Member Remy. Council Member White. All right. I, well, I would just add to Council Member Favor's um, uh, announcement around Black History Month that we too are going to celebrate the contributions that black artists have made to the city of Columbus. Uh, on February 16th at the Lincoln Theater, we'll have our annual Black History Month celebration and Point Dexter Award Ceremony. So we encourage folks to come out uh, and be part of that celebration. It's really going to be be something. We're really excited about the um, art that we will see even that day. So come out. Are there any comments from our elected officials from the city treasurer of the city attorney's office or auditors? Seeing none. Um, are there any, any requests by members of council for the removal of an ordinance uh, or resolution from the consent portion of the agenda? Hearing none, hearing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading the titles of 30 legislation by the clerk? Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorrance, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Thank you. Will the clerk now read to the record the ordinance numbers of 30 day legislation on tonight's agenda? Finance and Governance Committee, ordinances 255, 261, 265, 270, and 313-2024, Neighborhoods, Recreation, and Parks Committee, ordinance 128, Dash 2024 Workforce Education and Labor Committee Ordinance 197 Dash 2024 Housing Homelessness and Building Committee Ordinances 276 302 316 Dash 2024 Public Safety and Criminal Justice Committee Ordinances 181 and 285 Dash 2024 Public Utilities and Sustainability Committee Ordinance 191 Dash 2024 Zoning Committee Ordinances 3392 Dash 2023 and ordinances 286, 343, 356, and 358 2024. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We don't have any uh, speakers on the first reading portion of the agenda, so the following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent. Will the clerk read those into the record? Finance and Governance Committee, <coughs> ordinances 162, 219, 226, 236, 251, 294 2024. Neighborhoods, Recreation and Parks Committee, ordinances 126 and 132 2024. Housing, Homelessness and Building Committee, ordinance 336 2024. Public Utilities and Sustainability Committee, ordinances 115, 125, 165, and 250 2024. Rules and Policy Committee, appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0177, 179, 180-2023 and appointments 34, 35, 36, and 37 2024. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, there are no speakings on the consent portion of the agenda uh, as well. Are there any questions or comments on the consent portion? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Consent agenda is passed. We'll now proceed with the second reading of 30-day postponed and emergency legislation. 
First committee to come before council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee, chaired by Councilmember Rosa de Padilla. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. I have one ordinance today in public service, and that's 0221 2024 to authorize the transfer of funds within the Morse Road to fund and the Crossroads TIF Fund to appropriate funds in the Morse Road TIF Fund and the Crossroads TIF Fund to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Service to enter into contract with Shelley and Sands Incorporated for the Roadway Improvements and Clare Road Sidewakes Project to authorize the expenditure of up to $4,208,039.72 from the Morse Road TIF Fund and the Crossroads TIF Fund for the project and to declare an emergency. This project consists of installing new sidewalks along both sides of Sinclair Road from Morse Road to Stripple Avenue, in addition to, tra to traffic signal updates at both the I-71 southbound exit at Sinclair Road and Freeway Drive North at Sinclair Road intersections and other work as necessary. The contract includes the construction of a new seven-foot sidewalk adjacent to the existing curb along both sides of Sinclair Road from Morse Road North to just south of Bull Moose Run and sidewalks north of Bull Moose Run to Stripple Avenue. Uh, we do have one speaker on this ordinance. I'd like to call up Ben Keith. Mr. Keith, welcome back to council, I believe. And uh, you're gonna state your name, any organizations you're affiliated with, and you have three minutes. Yep, oh, well, thank you, council member Barossa de Padilla. Uh, my name is Ben Keith. I am a commissioner on the, and zoning committee chair on the North London Area Commission, but to comment on the Sinclair Road Sidewalks Ordinance, I'm just here as a concerned member of the community. Uh, I'm marked as opposed, but that's kind of misleading. This project is better than the status quo, but it's not good enough and I hope that the city can make it better while still passing the funding ordinance. Planning work for these improvements on Sinclair Road started in 2020. In 2021, Columbus adopted its first Vision Zero policy with the goal of achieving, quote, zero fatalities and serious injuries from crashes on city streets, end quote. Columbus said that, quote, speed is recognized and prioritized as the fundamental factor in crash severity, end quote. And Columbus committed to building complete street infrastructure, including separating pedestrians and bicyclists from cars. In 2023, Columbus published the Vision Zero Action Plan 2.0 saying, quote, we commit to protecting lives above all else on our city transportation system, end quote. The plan talked big about providing more separated bikeways, more complete streets, and more shared use paths. But if this city's Vision Zero commitment to all road users was serious, why does this project propose sidewalks instead of shared use paths, with no consideration for bikes or scooters on a 45 mile an hour road? Your average bike or scooter cannot go 45 miles an hour. The safest thing for us to do is not ride in the road, but riding in the road is the only legal thing that this project allows. Columbus City Code section 2173.10 bans riding bicycles and scooters on sidewalks. So we're left with three options. You do the safe but legal thing and ride on the sidewalk. Oh, safe but illegal thing and ride on the sidewalk. Or you do the legal thing by riding in the road and you risk your life and limb. Or you just give up, don't ride at all, and contribute to Columbus's growing pollution and traffic problems. None of these options are in keeping with Columbus Vision Zero goals or Columbus Climate Action Policy goals. And to fix this, I request that the city do three things. The Department of Public Service needs to revise this project to add a shared use path on at least one side of Sinclair Road, connecting the Morse Road bike lanes to the rest of the city. And I hope that you can do that without delaying construction. Second, city council needs to repeal city code section 2173.10, or at the very least amend that section to allow riding bikes on the sidewalk in cases where the road is unsafe. And third, Council needs to require complete streets policy compliance on all projects currently being designed and on all future projects. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Keith. Do you want to stay for just a second? I'm going to um, give it over to the interim director to right. respond. Good evening. Um, I will say that this project predates Vision Zero. I mean, it really, it's been in development for many, many years. Um, it is a sidewalk project. It's going to have to remain a sidewalk project due to the right of way that we acquired for this project. I do hear you, um, and I would like to talk, you know, about how we can do better in the future, um, but this project is going to have to remain a sidewalk project. I do hear the concerns, and I, you know, Looking back, it, it should have probably been a shared use path on one side of the road. I'm not going to. I'm not going to debate that. Thank you, Director. So, Mr. Keith, the one thing I do want to point out is, um, and I 
we read each one of the written pieces of testimony that I know several of them had suggestions or some best practices for us to look at. So we will look at the pieces of code that you're talking about and we will take those things into consideration to understand in terms of legislation, specifically where are the places that we can make changes so that we can allow for safety. So I wanna thank you for bringing those to our attention this evening. Um, and thank you, Interim Director. Thank Skoko. you, Director and Council Member. Thank you. Uh, do my colleagues have any other questions? Comments? Great. For that, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barossa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorrance, Faber, Green, <coughs> Remy, White, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. That's all for me this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next committee to come before council is the Housing, Homelessness, and Building Committee, chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, we have Ordinance 0. 300-2024 to authorize the director of the Department of Development to enter into a not-for-profit service contract with the Affordable Housing Trust for Columbus and Franklin County to facilitate the production of affordable housing and enhance home ownership opportunities in Columbus to authorize the expenditure of 0.43% of the combined rates of 5.1% of the hotel motel short-term rental excise tax presently estimated at $2,317,000 and to declare an emergency. At this time, I'd like to invite Lark Mallory, the president and CEO of the Affordable Housing Trust, uh, to the podium. The Affordable Housing Trust for Columbus and Franklin County combines public and private funding through a variety of sources to support the development of housing within the city. Both rental units and home ownership projects are developed. In 2024, the city will commit its annual contribution of the hotel motel short-term rental tax receipts of the housing trust at an estimated $2,317,000. The amount is based on 0.43% in relation to the 5.1% combined rate. Payments will be made to the housing trust by the auditor's office on a monthly basis up to the amount available in the fund, which in total may be more or less than the estimated amount. Funding is contingent upon the passage of Ordinance 3011-2023. Last year's allocation was $2,091,000, showing that the bed tax receipts are sustained from last year and are continuing to rebound from COVID. Um, Director Stevens, before I turn the podium over to uh, President Mallory, do you have any additional comments you'd like to add? Uh, thank you, President Harden, Chair Favor, members of council. I'll be quick because um, Lark Mallory is much better advocate for this work, but uh, I just want to thank her and the leadership she's shown uh, around housing and the investment and the work and the creative, innovative thinking she's doing to address our housing needs. Thank you, Ms. Mallory. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, City Council President Harden. Thank you, Chair Favor, and thank you for inviting me out. Um, also want to thank you to a couple of developers who are with us today to show the importance of what we do. On Saturday, I had an exchange with Jeff Woda from Woda Cooper and also shared with him that I would be here today. He took time out of his busy schedule to be with us, so thank you, Jeff. And also spoke to our third cohort in our emerging developers, and I am going to embarrass them and ask them to stand up because I told them I'd be here today and they showed up in full force. So, and Ms. Maller, can you specify what, who are these folks that just stood oh, up? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So as you know, AHT started the Emerging Developers Accelerator Program. It is a six-month training program for underrepresented developers of color and women. I generally teach the first session that gives them an overview of Affordable Housing 101 and the Affordable Housing Trust. That was Saturday. I just want to note that was Saturday morning. Today is Monday and they are here. And that just really goes to show the importance of what AHT does and the importance of this funding. So you have everyone from a prolific LIHTC developer to our brand new developers here to say how important this funding is. And I am timing myself. Um, over our 20 year history, AHT has used the funding from the city of Columbus and Franklin County to make over 320 million in loans that has created or preserved 14,000 units. 
Just last year alone, we made 68 million in loans and that created or preserved 1,400 units. What you can't see in this slide too much detail is that the, the majority of those loans are in the 30 to 80% AMI. 30% AMI, those are minimum wage workers. 60% AMI, that's a teacher. Police officers somewhere between 80 and 100% AMI. So we're not just talking about our neediest citizens. We're also talking about the folks who provide a service to us every single day. I mentioned our emerging developers since we've started this program. We've loaned almost 8 million to them. And that's 79 units created by black and brown and women developers. What does this do? What does the funding actually do? It allows us to buy down the rents. No developer at all is going to do a project that makes him or her lose money or doesn't make it pencil out. These low interest rate loans that we, that we make to the developers allow us to buy down rents. So here's an example of a project that we funded. 51% of the units at 80% AMI. Who earns 80%? That's a building inspector. We know how much building we are doing in central Ohio. Building inspectors need a place to live. Who earns 100% AMI? Our school psychologists. Mental health issues are real. Home issues are real. We need school psychologists. One more slide because I'm over. Um, this is a LIHTC project. And this is how we get to our deep affordability. This project created 20% of the units at 30% AMI. As I mentioned, those are minimum wage workers. 50% AMI, that's a supervisor at a retail establishment. And then obviously 60% AMI, nurses and teachers. So this funding that you provide to AHT allows us to create the units that our growing economy needs. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Mallory? I truly appreciate you taking the time to walk through um, what it looks like to put a stack together, a financial stack together for folks. I, I think there is this um, notion that it is cheaper to build affordable housing, affordable housing, and it's not. It literally costs the same as building market rate. And as you indicated, uh, we have to find a way to subsidize um, those costs to ensure that uh, folks who need to be in that 30 to 80 percent of the area median income can have a place to live. It is complicated, though, and there are a lot of things that have to go into play. And so we appreciate the partnership between the Affordable Housing Trust, um, the Department of Development, uh, as we work to uh, provide all types of housing across all um, levels of income. Any additional questions or comments by my colleagues? Um this is a, an executive summary of an overall presentation. I know that I know most of you personally, um, but I do want to extend myself that if you want me to come over or you want to see our offices meet for coffee, I am willing to walk through the lengthier presentation. Thank you. With that, I would move for passage. Thank oh, you. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I was just going to make the point. It's a small point, but I think it's, it's a big presentation, big in your presentation. When we, we talk so often about AMI, AMI, mm -hmm. so many folks don't understand or don't, don't know who we're talking about. And even some folks in our community think that those people are moving in. The way that you just broke down uh, what uh, area medium income is and what that means to our actual residents and workers in our community was brilliant. And I think that all of us need to adopt that language. I know that President Pro Tem, when he's going through zonings now, uh, talks about uh, AMI that way, about who this actually is. So I just want to acknowledge that that is uh, how we should be talking about housing and affordability from here on out in Columbus. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'd move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Thanks, Den Barosa de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorans, Faber Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. That's all I have in my committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next committee to come for counsel is the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Committee, chaired by Councilmember Remy. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. Tonight, I have 260 2024 to authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer 490000 from the general fund to the specialty docket program for the Franklin County Municipal Court. The court operates five specialized dockets, which have been certified or are in the process of receiving certification from the Supreme Court of Ohio Commission on Specialized Dockets. The specialized dockets 
hold criminal offenders accountable where, while linking them with comprehensive treatment and services, which reduces recidivism and increases community safety. In April 20, 2004, the mental health program was created to better serve criminal defendants who are impacted by severe mental illness and who have pending cases before the court. In 2009, the Changing Actions to Change Habits, the Catch Court program, was created to better serve criminal defendants who have been charged with misdemeanor solicitation pr prostitution prostitution and or loitering to solicit. The docket also serves people convicted of other crimes that were committed while the participant was a victim of human trafficking. Participants may have severe depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, or other mental illnesses and may be dependent on alcohol and or drugs. Because many of the participants have been the victims of human trafficking, CATCH focuses on the trauma experienced by the participants. In 2009, the Alcohol and Drug Addiction Program, the ADAP program, was created to serve criminal defense who are dependent on drugs and or alcohol and who have um, pending legal issues before the court. So in 2012, the Military and Veteran Service Specialized Docket was created to better serve the criminal defendants who have severe mental illness, chemical dependency, and criminal logic factors, all of which impact their ability to access and navigate services afforded to them because of the military involvement after they are charged with a misdemeanor offense. The overall goal and the, and the, the fact that the, municipal, the Franklin County Municipal Court has more specialized dockets than just about any other court in the state, um, each of these programs is to decrease the number of jail nights and new summons that participants receive by diverting them to clinically appropriate treatment options and helping them. They do a fabulous job so, over there um, with these diversion programs, and it's exciting to support this important legislation. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues this evening? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorans, Favor, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Pass. That is all I have in public safety and criminal justice this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next committee to come before council is the Public Utilities and Sustainability Committee, chaired by Councilmember White. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Harding. Tonight in Public Utilities and Sustainability, we have four ordinances coming before Council today. Uh, first, we have 0099-2024 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate current and pending universal term contract purchase agreements for the purchase of water treatment chemicals for the Division of Water to authorize the expenditure of $23,200,000 from the Water Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, this emergency de designation will allow the department to purchase the chemicals necessary to keep our drinking water safe. Let me pause there, see if there are any questions from my colleagues. Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorans, Favor, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Perfect, thanks. Next we have Ordinance 0136-2024 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a professional consulting services agreement with Raftilis Financial Consultants, Inc. for operational review and strategic plan development consulting services to authorize the expenditure of 150000 split among the electricity, water, sanitary sewer, and stormwater operating funds and to waive the competitive bidding provision of city code. Um, I want to kick this over to Deputy Director Shockey just to talk about the waiving of competitive bidding. Thank you, Council President Hardin, Chair Weish, members of Council. Uh, this is a technical bid waiver. The contract was competitively bid. Um, there was a lapse in the term of the contract which required us to execute a new contract. Uh, this funding is necessary to complete our strategic planning work for the department. Thank you, Deputy Director. Are there any questions from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. All right, next we have ordinance. Sorry about that. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0155-2024 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate current and pending universal term contract purchase agreements for the purchase of material supplies and services for the Division of Sewerage and Drainage, Jackson Pike Wastewater Treatment Plant, and to authorize the expenditure of $3,139,000 from the Sewerage Operating Fund. 
Uh, the parts, materials, and services from these contracts are used to monitor, maintain, and repair equipment throughout the wastewater treatment plant as required by federal and state standards. Uh, let me pause there and see if there are any questions from my colleagues. Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroza de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorrance, Favorite Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. And last, we have Ordinance 0157-2024 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate current and pending universal term contract purchase agreements for the purchase of material supplies and services for the division of sewerage and drainage sewer maintenance operations center and to authorize the expenditure of four million two hundred and fifteen thousand from the sewer operating fund uh, this contract will be used at the sewer maintenance operations center for materials parts and services uh, to monitor maintain and repair equipment uh, plus maintain the facility i'll pause there and see if there are any questions or comments from my colleagues seeing none i move for passage Second. clerk please call the roll Bankston, Barroza de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorrance, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. And that is all I have from my committee tonight. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that uh, is the last piece of legislation. Uh, before uh, we adjourn this meeting and go to non-agenda, I did want to um, just clarify. Last week, uh, we had uh, our uh, Mr. Wilkins uh, speak twice on non-agenda, and there was just some confusion. And so I just wanted to clarify for everyone with the what the section of the code says, so uh, section 111.12 of the city code states that for regular business meetings of council, individuals are permitted to submit a total of two speaker slips. So you can speak twice at a, at a council meeting, but of those two slips, only one may be used during non-agenda. So you can speak once during the actual meeting and once during the agenda. Uh, Mr. Wilkins can always come and does always come. It's actually kind of sad I don't see him on tonight. Uh, but uh, we'll have one speaker per uh, non-agenda uh, as the rules follows. But if there's no further business coming for council, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barroza de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorrance, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Meeting is adjourned.
Bangston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Are there any additions or corrections to the journal? Hearing none, the journal is approved. We'll now go to the zoning committee. Uh, Press Pro Tim chairs that committee. All members serve on it. Thank you, Council President. Before we begin, begin tonight's zoning agenda, First, a little bit of housekeeping. Would the clerk please read the numbers of legislation and zoning committee this evening that require waiver of second reading? 0266 and 0284-2024. Thank you. I now move to waive second reading of those items read aloud. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Thank you, Clerk. Uh, now, let me allow me to briefly explain our current rules pertaining to speaking before council and rezonings and variances. We only hear a staff presentation for ordinances that have a disapproval from a recommending body or if we have a public speaker uh, signed up to speak against an ordinance. Uh, this evening, we do not have any public speakers on our agenda. Uh, all speakers on council variants, including city staff, area commission applicants, and members of the public will be sworn in before they give testimony. Representatives of area commission applicants are always able to speak on an ordinance and do not need to fill out a speaker slip. On the advice of the city attorney's office, I will now swear in city staff. Please stand and raise, raise your right hand and be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, nothing but the truth that you shall answer in a painful penalty of perjury? If so, please say I do. Thank you. Please let the record reflect that Tim Dietrich from the Department of Building and Zoning Services has been sworn in. First, we have Ordinance 0266-2024 to grant variance provisions of Section 3333.02 AR12 ARLD AR1 Apartment Residential District Uses, 3321.05 A1 Vision Clearance, 3321.05 B2 Vision Clearance, and 3372.607 A Landscape and Screening to Columbus City Code. So the property located at 1600 East Main Street to allow automotive repair and sales with reduced development standards in the ARLD Apartment Residential District and the repeal order Ordinance number 1061-81 passed June 8, 1981. Uh, this site consists of one parcel developed with an auto repair shop and auto part sales. The requested council variance will allow the continuation of automotive repair and part sales uses uh, while now allowing for sales of automobiles. Uh, the proposal has approvals from city staff and the Near East Area Commission. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Accept it. Thank you. And next move to adopt the finance of staffs, the finance of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Adopt it. And finally, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, <laughs> Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have Ordinance 0284-2024 to grant advance provisions of Section 3332.033 R2, Residential District of the Columbus City Coast, a property located at 2970 Askins Road to allow two-unit dwelling in the R2, residen or R2 a Residential District. Uh, the site is currently undeveloped, and the requested council variance will allow for the construction of a two-unit dwelling. Uh, council variance is required because the current district only allows a single-unit dwelling per lot as residential uses. Uh, the proposal has approval from city staff and the Mideast Area Commission. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I first move to accept the entire staff report into evidence as an exhibit. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Accept it. Thank you. Next, I move to adopt the finance of staff as the finance of council. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Adopt it. And finally, move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Pass. Thank you, Council President, and thanks to Council Member Green for the assist. That's mm -hmm. all we have in the zoning committee this evening. Seeing no further business coming for the council, is there no, no uh, motion to collect to call the roll? Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, Weich, President Harden. Adjourned.